Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm sure that the um, webcast is starting right now. It's not showing it on my screen, but nevertheless, what a privilege and what an honor it is to be able to be here with you to share with you the unsearchable riches of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, specifically as we deal with the history, or shall I say, in the words of the late great presiding bishop, former presiding bishop Chandler David Owens, the historicity of the Church of God in Christ. And today specifically, we're dealing with the Church of God in Christ, discipline of fasting, something that you don't hear about too much. And I'm going to be honest, out of all the documentation that I have, there is not too much documentation in regard to fasting. And we're going to find out why. So I do ask that you would please start getting in that comment section. I'll have a chance here at the end of this webcast to share with you uh, or to, uh, shall we say, list those different individuals that have listed their um, jurisdictions. Make sure you list your jurisdiction in the comment section, your bishop, as well as your supervisor. And do like I'm doing and like so many other people are doing. What are you doing, Hankerson? You're talking. No, don't talk during the webcast. But I need you to get on right now and share this webcast with someone as we talk about a subject again that you don't hear too often about, and that is the discipline of fasting in the Church of God in Christ. And to be honest, it's a part of our foundation. And uh, you'll hear why, at least my opinion and perspective on why that is something that is not talked about so much anymore in the Church of God in Christ. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. We're going to pray and go directly into what we have to share with you today as we talk about this discipline of fasting in the Church of God in Christ. Father, we thank you for this great and golden and magnificent and tremendous opportunity to share with our viewing audience the unsearchable riches of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, specifically as we deal with the history and doctrine, tenets, structure, and practices of the Church of God in Christ. Father, we thank you now and give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Let all the people of God say thank God and amen and make sure you place in the comment section. I see Doretha Williams from Williams Temple. God bless you. And she's on her way to Bible study. She is a member of that great church led by our second assistant presiding bishop, the Bishop Lawrence M. Wooten, the father of the general board. God bless also my supervisor, Supervisor T. Marie Brown. I see you. I see all of the comments that you're making, but make sure you contact someone right now and tell them that we're going to be dealing with some very uh, interesting tenets of our church, specifically in regard to the doctrine of fasting, or shall I say the practice of fasting, I won't call it a doctrine, um, but you can say that because the word doctrine, of course, means teaching. Just from the start, let me share this with you. Fasting was a regular practice of Bishop Charles Harrison Mason from the beginning of his ministry up until almost about the time of his death. And uh, I don't have the recording here to share with you uh, due to the fact that we will have to kind of prepare the saints for the recording that I did maybe 35 years ago. I would say about 35 or more years ago with Bishop Mason's widow, Mother Elsie Washington Mason. And she was sharing the fact that Bishop Mason was one that fasted on a regular basis. Um, her perspective is that, and of course, as you know, anytime you have a great individual, there's going to be all types of, shall we say, opinions that individuals have about that person. And when it came to Bishop Charles Harrison, uh, Mason, it stated that he did not talk a lot and it stated that he did not eat a lot. God bless you, A.L. Shaw, Darlene Thompson, all of you that are chiming in. Share with someone that we're on right now. Let's get those numbers up as we share about this uh, teaching. So he did not eat a whole lot as far as finding out what Bishop's favorite foods were and things like that. I haven't come across that information yet, but I do know that he did love candy. He loved hard candy like peppermints and things like that but there was not a lot of eating that he would do and not a lot of talking 
regular person, like we've shared with you before. However, he stayed in a sense of consecration. Now, the prayer tradition that Bishop Mason received came from the Baptist church. Of course, he was a devout Baptist minister for so many years, a devout Baptist throughout the early part of his life. And that prayer tradition, if you listen to a lot of the old school Baptist deacons and Baptist preachers praying and listen at the prayers of Bishop Mason and others from that era, there is a great similarity in those prayers. I know we're in a time now in uh, the life of the church where there's a lot of instrumentation. You may notice, and I love music, but you may notice that there are times where I will tell the musicians, uh, please stop playing for a few minutes and allow the saints to respond where we can hear the saints uh, sharing from their heart. There is a certain sound that the saints had years ago. And I, as I was sharing with, um, matter of fact, it was Superintendent Nathaniel Green, our international youth president, that I actually came along on the tail end of the afterglow of the Azusa Street experience and the experience of the early saints. And so other words, when I was born in the early 70s, specifically 1972, there were still people around from the 1800s, from those early years. And there was a major difference in church then versus church now. And one of those things was there was some call it mourning, some call it moaning, some call it humming. There was a certain sound um, that saints would make in prayer that they would make when the preacher, you could say, got under the anointing. I know now we talk about the art of preaching, the art of the celebration, the art of hooping, uh, hoopology, uh, people call it. And we talk about uh, modulation, changing keys, going from one key to the next. That was not the sense in those particular days. What they would tell you, definitely even as a young preacher, is study, get your information, pray, consecrate. But when you get up, you look for the anointing of God to take over your message and yield yourself to him so he can anoint you. Of course, people looking on the outside in would criticize that and say that's nothing but emotionalism, but it was the furthest thing from it. Because I remember a time you could get emotional, Bishop Moulton, so good to see you, and the saints would not um, respond at all because the saints were not moved by emotion. And I've seen some great preachers get up and the saints just sit there and look because they look at each other and say, well, they're not anointed. That's not the power of the Holy Ghost. And so uh, preaching to the saints was one of the hardest things that you would do in those particular um, years because there must be the anointing. And of course, when the anointing would hit, you would hear that, that holy hum, moaning, mourning, however you want to describe it. Of course, in the Baptist church, um, you'd hear the deacons and folks saying, well, you know, and they'd kind of go right along with the preacher and very similar even in the church of God in Christ, because remember, Bishop Mason came from that Baptist background and many of the early saints. Uh, Bishop Mason was a Baptist. Mother Robinson was a Baptist. O.T. Jones Sr. was a uh, Baptist and so many of the early leaders that was their background, either the Baptist church or the Methodist church. And so of course you had that tradition of prayer that when the saints would pray, there was a certain sound. However, when it comes to fasting, that is a totally different discipline. And as a student of history, I won't call myself a, a historian, but as a student of history, it's hard to correlate and find where Bishop Mason picked up that particular discipline and such an extreme version of that discipline. And so we don't have that particular bridge. And some of you may have that information. I've looked through the Azusa books. I've looked through the historical records and you just do not find it. 
However, Bishop Mason was one that was very committed to a life of fasting. The Holy Convocation, God bless you, James Weston, all the way from Saginaw, Michigan, Percy Wells from Las Vegas. That's it. Just keep mentioning um, who you are, where you're from, your jurisdiction. Please do that. And we will continue to interact. The Holy Convocation, there was a switch after the death of Bishop Mason, um, of course. And I don't want to start turning and twisting and knocking things down. But in 1961, that was the last convocation where Bishop Mason was serving as the senior bishop and the chief apostle. After he died, we've shared with you before that there was the, um, you could say, discrepancy, disturbance, division, strife between the executive board and the new senior bishop, which was Bishop O.T. Jones Sr. And so during that particular time, there were some things, and I don't know a nice way to put it, uh, Evangelist Sherry Ross, I'm trying to, Frost rather, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it, but there really isn't a nice way to put it. There were practices of Bishop Mason that were basically thrown out the window after he died. And some practices they were seeking to throw out the window before he died. But once he went off the scene, then, of course, um, those practices were trash, for lack of a better term. One thing in particular is that the Holy Convocation would start off with three days and three nights of fasting and prayer. God bless um, Pastor Courtney King all the way from the United Kingdom. And thank you so much for the support uh, that you and the jurisdiction there with Bishop Blake uh, Bishop Alvin Blake there in the United Kingdom are giving us at this time. Appreciate it. So there was three days and three nights of fasting and prayer. Bishop Mason during those 72 hours would remain in the um, sanctuary, wherever that might be, because hopefully everybody realizes as much as we esteem Mason Temple, there was many, many years of service in the Church of God in Christ where um, Bishop, um, not Bishop Mason, but Mason Temple was not even thought about. Yeah, um, one of you brought up a very important point here. James Weston said, my late Bishop, Bishop H.J. J. Williams told us things were thrown out. So thank you so much for um, confirming what I'm saying. And again, you can see I'm trying to be very diplomatic at what I say but it's really hard to be diplomatic with this. There were things that were just thrown out completely. So for those 72 hours, whether the convocation was at Wellington Street, whether it was at Lauderdale Street, Fifth Street, which became Mason Street, one convocation was held in what's now known as the First Assemblies of God Church in Memphis, Tennessee, because the First Assemblies of God Church in Memphis, Tennessee, originally was Church of God in Christ and the international convocation was held there on one occasion uh, and then when they left and went with the assemblies of god the general council of the assemblies of god was held in that church and i think that's the only church in the world that can state that the two largest pentecostal denominations have both had their national meeting in that church so those 72 hours bishop mason would do an extreme fast when Bishop Mason fasted, there was no food, no water, and prayed most of the time. There were other people that would lead out in prayer, and there were times that he would lead the prayer. Now, the reason for those 72 hours of fasting and prayer was to take your mind off of natural things, to take your mind off your natural schedule, and to prepare your heart to go into now a season of spirituality, because at that time, the convocation would last 20 21, 22, 25 days. Um, and somebody may say, well, I don't understand that. Wasn't there a set schedule? There was not per se a set schedule. This was a total difference. Bishop Mason did not believe in pre-selected speakers, pre-selected program, advertisement, because that's not what occurred at Azusa Street. The Holy Convocation was to be the institutionalism or the institutionalized version of the Azusa Street Revival. And in the Azusa Street Revival, there was no 
There were no handbills handed out, no flyers, no advertisement, no marketing, uh, no announcement of big speakers as we do in this day and time. Not knocking that because we all do it. We all have flyers and announcements, but that's just not how Azusa Street was ran. That was a spiritual renewal that was to reverberate around the world. So it was different from just a local church or an organization. So Bishop Mason sought to institutionalize that experience. So once you went into the actual setting of the Holy Convocation, um, you may not know who the speaker is going to be. It would be who the Lord would say. And the Lord would raise up someone to speak and to let Mother Elsie Mason tell it. As she told me, she said the preachers would almost help hold you spellbound because um, it was a spiritual focus. And you wouldn't even realize that you had been in church so long because the convocation ran 24 hours a day for those days. And so it may go 20 days and the Lord may say, take it a little bit further, take it a few more days. So it would last as close as as much as 25 days. And the saints told me there was no such thing as your Thanksgiving and sometimes even your Christmas back then, because that time was spent in the Holy Convocation. And remember, black people as a whole did not have a whole lot to look forward to in this world anyway. So you didn't have all of those distractions. Oh, we're going to have a great big Thanksgiving dinner. We're going to go here and go there. We're going to Disneyland for Christmas. And black people just did not have that type of luxury at that time, at least not all. And so the most you had to look forward to in your life was Jesus. That was it. And so, of course, um, without those, I don't want to call them distractions, but without those luxuries, there was the focus on spiritual things. However, once Bishop Mason passed and there was the division between the new senior bishop and the executive board, the new senior bishop, Bishop O.T. Jones, requested of the executive board, brethren, let's follow the practice of Bishop Mason during the 72 hours of fasting and prayer. There was no business. There was no deliberations as far as the different councils of the church no different meetings. It was completely focused on fasting and praying and meetings did not occur and business did not occur until after the 72 hours. Well, the executive board ends up ignoring Bishop O.T. Jones and they go ahead, have meetings and take up offerings because that's one thing he was saying. Let's not raise any money during this time. Let's not mar this sacred atmosphere that's been set by our revered founder um, by doing things like that. They ignored him. First thing they did, let's take up an offering. And so the infighting back and forth, and I'm not taking sides when it comes to that because each side had their own issues. Through that infighting, the 72 hour consecration time of fasting and prayer was basically thrown out the door. It was marred at that particular time. And this is one reason why I believe you don't hear much about fasting so much in our uh, discipline because not only did that occur, but I believe many of the early saints were traumatized. And the reason I say traumatized, I listened at something that the late Bishop F.D. Washington stated. He stated that there were many people that had said, let's not remember those days. Let's forget about those days of Bishop Mason. Let's put all of that behind us and let's move forward. Now, those in upcoming generations and those that are not familiar with everything that happened back then would ask and say, that's a horrible thing to say because we thought everything was so wonderful and there were healings and miracles and all of this that would take place. But please understand, if you're a pastor, if you're a bishop, if you're any kind of spiritual leader, you know how it is. Everyone doesn't always have your heart. You may have a vision. You may have what God has placed on your heart. Everyone doesn't catch that. And so, again, I'm trying to be very tactful at how I say this. I don't know really how to say it without being blunt. There's just a lot of people that didn't take on Bishop Mason's heart. They did not have the heart of the leader. Uh, they had the form of the leader. They had um, the somewhat the style of the leader. But as far as having the heart of the leader, where he said in uh, 19, 
26. Let's get the people to God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's what this is all about is leadership. Uh, you had people that just did not catch that heart. What ends up happening is Pentecostals and black people as a whole start to progress and prosper. And so looking back on those times of fasting and suffering, there are people that just did not want to rehash that and live through that. And again, a lot of people were traumatized. Again, I came along during the days of the latter glory of those that had um, experienced all of what God had done. As a matter of fact, as young as I am in my lifetime, I've seen two eyewitnesses of the Azusa Street Revival. One lady was a Caucasian lady, and you could tell that she had been somewhere. You could just tell by how she talked that the power of God just permeated from her. And she talked about those days of the Azusa Street Revival. And so I'm uh, young enough to be able to relate to, you know, the up and coming generation, but old enough to remember individuals that experienced that glory. And one thing you would constantly hear the saints say back when, quoting from Haggai, who is left among you that saw this house in its first glory? And how do you see it now? They were saying that back in the day. Imagine what they would say now with all of the things that we see so much among religious groups now. But basically, the fasting uh, traumatized some individuals because I did interview so many of the early saints. And I would talk, of course, as a young man, oh, you all used to fast back when. And the response I would get from many of the saints was, that's because we didn't have any food. So because we didn't have any food, there was nothing to do but to fast all the time. So that's one reason you can study your Sunday school book. I looked in the Sunday school book. I looked in Bishop Plez's book. I looked in Mother Mary Mason's book. I looked at the yearbook. I looked through all of these annual books, the discipline of the church. I looked through the Church of God in Christ manual. And you are not going to find anything that is speaking much at all. If there is anything, it's very little, if at all, about the discipline of fasting. Nevertheless, this was one of the major practices of the Church of God in Christ that Bishop Mason passed on to the church. And unfortunately, it is something that um, basically has been thrown out and there is not that emphasis anymore. Of course, through his influence, you had the tearing, you had the shut-ins. I taught our church Sunday. Now, Sunday at Life Center, I had a very harsh message. If you go to the Life Center Facebook page, you can see that message. And it was a very harsh message. And Bishop Doss, um, I told the saints, I said, if you're offended, if you're angry, I said, good, because I do not apologize. I'll add to it before I take away from it because the blood is not going to be on my hand. And so there were some very strong things that were said. But one of the things I say to the saints is, we can't always have inspiration, motivation. We must hear from God because God told the preacher, cry loud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. And if we fail to do that as the men and women of God, the blood is on our hands. And I've gone through too much in life to get before God and God say, you got blood on your hands. That's not going to happen. And so I shared with the saints about that and literally took a time to teach the saints even how to tarry in the presence of God. We got one individual, I say, you stand and you face this way and start thanking God. Got another brother on this side, I say, you start thanking him, facing the brother, you start thanking him over here, facing him. And I said, just start telling him thank you. Now, how long do we do that? I say, you do that until you come through speaking in tongues. You do that until you come through delivered from your sins. And it's not so much just the tongue, you stayed on the altar, to get all that junk out, to get all of that junk, because we were taught that when you fasted, you didn't just go on a fast, you had to repent. And we were taught that it is, um, and it is something you're not going to find it in the theological books, but the way the old saints would describe it, you don't want to fast all that junk up in you. You, you don't want to cover all that up with the fast, but repent 
Humble yourself. Get the junk out of you. Stay on the altar before God. Get it out of you. Then you're prepared to fast. And this is what Bishop Mason passed on to the church. Unfortunately, people did not catch that. Prosperity entered in. Then all of a sudden we went from cotton sacks to Cadillacs. We went from the cotton gin to Mercedes Benz. Um, we went from the gin house to the White House. And now all of a sudden that's not a practice. But Bishop Mason set it up that every Tuesday and every Friday was fast. I mean, I looked everywhere. I tried to, saints, I tried to find it. I looked in the ordination book. I looked in the membership manual. I looked every place and I couldn't find nothing. Like the song said, I couldn't find nobody. I couldn't find nothing. I said, how is it that this was such a major principle that came from the leader and you can't find anything about it? Again, one reason is people were traumatized and they felt that we went through all those times of suffering, those times of lack. Now we can get a steak dinner when we want to. So we're not going back to that. And unfortunately, this is going to be kind of strong for me to say it, but it's the truth anyhow. Um, unfortunately, it was a little bit of the great generation, the baby boom generation and my generation that really have turn things in the wrong direction. I'm hoping and praying that the new generations coming on will um, uh, change that. Now, again, that's very harsh for me to say, but why am I saying that? Well, with the great generation that came along, of course, after World War II, there was a time of prosperity. As this prosperity came in, people didn't want to focus on all that suffering. It's, it's suffering when you talk about fasting. It's suffering when you talk about putting the plate and the water and everything aside. And then, of course, the generation that came after that, your baby boom generation. I heard baby boomers saying back in the day, I'm not going through all that like my parents did. I'm not doing all of that. I heard baby boomers saying, I'm not going to be in church every night. I'm not going to be in no kitchen on no Saturday frying chicken talking about we're, you know, raising funds for the church. That's not going to happen. And then, of course, when my generation came along, many said it just doesn't take all of that. And look at what we have now. Again, how many of you are left that seen the house in its first glory? And how do you see it now? When I was talking to President Green the other day, I said, President Green, I've seen a cloud in the church. I know you, you, you can't make me take this watered down, compromise, half baked thing that people now call uh, the faith because it's, it's not. I've seen the cloud. I've literally seen the Lord Jesus walk into a church. I've seen the healings and the miracles and the things. I've, I've looked and seen flames coming out the church. I've seen that. I've experienced that. I've experienced the glory of God. I've seen the saints rejoice to the point that they thought you, you, you would have felt it was an earthquake. I remember Bishop Doss individuals telling me, I'm not coming to your church. Bishop Doss is on here. We grew up together in the state of Washington. I, I went to... Um, I think Bishop Dodge, you went to Jason Lee. I went to um, Stewart Junior High School. And I remember kids at Stewart Junior High I'd invite people to church. They said, I'm not going to your church. And the reason why people would not want to come was because they said something was going to get on them. If, <laughs> if I go to that church, something is going to get on me. And, and there was a fear that people had and a reverence people had for the saints. That Yeah, you went to hunt. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a fear and a reverence that people had for the saints. One person told there was a few young people. We were from New Jerusalem and we were trying to invite one of the young people to revive. We said, oh, no, if you all going to be acting like how you talking about, I am not coming there. There was a there was a fear. There was a reverence. And so my question is, where is that reverence now? Where is that fear now? Where is that respect? I know evangelist Brandon Hollis, God bless you, elder, that the saints went to an extreme. And this is what I said on Sunday. What I said on Sunday is this, and I mean it from my heart. And if people get upset, you just have to get upset. I said, I know that we were at an extreme back in the day. You weren't to wear red. You weren't to go to movies. You poor ladies, you don't think about putting on any whatever y'all call that mascara red lipstick and all those kind of things and fingernail polish and all of that 
I thank God for my late wife. She she would res she respect me. She loved red lipstick, but she would tone it down for me um, because I just have my beliefs and my convictions that the saints are different as brothers. We didn't. These preachers get up now with muscle shirts and all of that. Oh no, well, Hankerson, y'all just mad because you don't have the muscles. No, it's not a sex show. This is church. This is the house of God. People would walk in and get on their knees. There were certain things you just didn't come into church with. And I know people say that's an extreme and it's not in the clothes. And I understand that. I was even called a clothesline preacher. So you all told us to leave the clothes alone. Let the folks wear what they're going to wear. Let them come as you are. And you see what's happening now? They're sure enough coming as they are. Men dressing up like women. Women dressing up like men. You all said it's not in the clothes, so you can't complain and say <laughs> it's not in the clothes. But now here's what's happened. Sown to the wind and reap the whirlwind. There was an extreme, but let me say this. The reason there was that extreme is the saints knew. You give the devil an inch, he's going to take a mile. So they weren't asking that question. How much can I get away with and still be saved? They didn't even want to look like the world act like the world. The saints took joy in the fact that we are different. We're different from everybody else. And a part of that difference was the discipline of fasting, because when you fast, you're killing that flesh and that flesh, not the physical body, but that sinful nature where you can have power over sin. That's what the emphasis was in being sanctified, not just the dancing that people do nowadays where everybody's dancing the same step when i came along everybody wasn't dancing the same step and as a matter of fact when the holy ghost hit somebody you don't know what kind of step that they would cut yes people had fancy steps and things like that but there was a certain anointing that was in it. i heard somebody i didn't hear somebody but i saw someone on here talking about mother vera boykins god used her here in st louis in the 1940s and she would just dance 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 and just touch somebody boom they fall out and get up heel and uh, get up delivered and god used her in a great way and there were a lot of people that thought this was an extreme this was not god and so they wrote to bishop mason and bishop mason came to st louis to investigate and when he came to st louis to investigate the saints were up in a uproar praising and magnifying god mother boykins was rejoicing everybody was rejoicing and bishop mason said peace and what that meant that meant to stop Everybody went all else went on rejoicing. She stopped. And when she stopped, Bishop Mason said, that's God. And the reason why that's God is because she's yet has an obedient spirit. It's not a wild spirit. See, that's holiness is not wild. A lot of people think you all just go, go. No. Uh, one time Bishop Mason was at a church. You heard me tell this story. And the host bishop was trying to move on with the service. And one of the ladies kept, I got to tell it. I got to tell it. And so the host bishop said, no, no, sister, not right now. I got to tell it. I got to tell it. And so she just kept on until finally Bishop Mason hollered out, fool, sit down. You know, he didn't bite his tongue. Back then, those leaders had such an aura about them. And yes, there, I know I hear people say now, well, everybody wasn't perfect and you had scandals. I mean, everybody, everybody didn't have scandals now. Everybody didn't have scandals and you can't use that as an excuse to just do anything because, well, you found out so-and-so had a scandal. There was somebody living right. God is always going to have a witness. One of those individuals I know was without scandal was my late pastor, Bishop T.L. Westbrook, married 63 years, no scandal, clean reputation, clean life. His wife lived a clean life and their family can even attest to that, that this was a true man of God. That's the kind of foundation that I came up under. You'd walk into New Jerusalem. One time I walked in, I thought someone had died. As I said, there's a body on the floor. It was Bishop Westbrook laid out on the altar, crying out to God. And so this came from that discipline of fasting. Let me share a few things in regard to that as far as Bishop Mason's practice of fasting. And we believe in God that we will all follow that and adhere to that. Bishop Mason taught us to fast twice a week, Tuesday and Friday. And of course, in the Bible, you can see that they fasted twice a week. Now, of course, we're not to get caught up into ourselves and brag on it.
But Luke 18 and 12 says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. It is a known fact that Jews in those days would fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Bishop Mason got that from the Bible. Our fast days are Tuesday and Friday. We fast on Tuesday for healing and Friday for strength. Remember that Tuesday is for healing and Friday is for strength. Generally, it's midnight to three. Some may just go until 12 noon. Some may go a little bit longer. Some may go all day long. But Tuesday and Fridays, at least during the Mason era, were holy days in the church of God in Christ. And let us maintain that discipline. Now, there's different types of fasts, and we'll tell you the kind that Bishop Mason taught. Of course, there's a supernatural fast, and you find that in Exodus 34, 28. And he was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, and he didn't either eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And so that was Moses, and that was definitely a supernatural fast because you cannot live, uh, you, you can live 40 days without eating. You can't live 40 days without drinking water. And so that was a supernatural fast. That would have to be God to put you on a fast like that. Jesus, we believe, did a water only fast because when you look at Matthew 4 and 2 during his 40 days, it says that when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. It did not say that he was thirsty, but he was hungered. God bless you, Lady Bradford. We're continuing to pray for you and your family. Thank God for you. So Matthew 4 and 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. And again, it's not saying that per se he was um, thirsty and needed uh, uh, water. So it is believed that he did actually drink water uh, during that time. The other kind of fast is the one that Bishop Mason uh, led us in, in the Church of God in Christ, and that's the extreme fast. And it says in Acts 9 and 9, and he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. And so in the Church of God in Christ, that was a common fast, a common fast. And this is separate from the Tuesday and Friday. So Tuesday and Friday, those are already fast days in the church of God in Christ. Can everybody please say that? Put that. It'd be, it'd be wonderful if we could have a revival of fasting and praying. And again, I have not found the historical connection on where Bishop Mason got that from. Because again, when you study his history, his prayer tradition came from the Baptist church. In those particular days, and I'm not knocking denominations, I'm simply telling you the facts of those days. You did not have that discipline of fasting like that in the Baptist church. So I'm not certain where he got it from. You don't find that mentioned a whole lot at Azusa. Of course, at Azusa, the prayer tradition was very strong. W.J. Seymour would pray eight hours a day. Of course, Bishop Mason would pray eight and nine hours a day. So there was that prayer tradition. But the tradition of fasting, not I'm this this author, this videographer is not certain where that actually came from, that influence on Bishop Mason. However, he used his influence to put it into the fabric and teaching of the Church of God in Christ. And so the fast that he would have the saints do was a extreme fast, no food, no water. And if you remember, saints, no breath mints, no mouthwash, nothing, breath stinking, all of that. Um, but that is how we were actually taught to fast. We didn't know anything about a Daniel fast. And I'm not knocking a Daniel fast or anything like that. I'd rather somebody at least try and do a Daniel fast and not to have a mindset to fast at all. Whether that's effective or not. I'm not going to say because when you study the book of Daniel, that's not really listed as a consecration per se uh, that we would call one as far as fasting. But it could be a form of consecration because Daniel said during that time, I'm not going to eat any of the king's meat or delicacies. I'm not eating something that is not kosher. So allow me to do this. And so that's a, a form of consecration, uh, you can say. But then when it when it comes to fasting, our our, our, our spirit should be clean. We should 
Uh, <laughs> Lord, I shouldn't tell this, but I had a member of the church that had went on a fast. And um, I think it was a three day fast. And after she got off the fast, she tried to kill her husband. What? Yeah. Um, what? She got off the fast and she's told this story at the church, had us laughing like crazy. And I guess she was it must have messed with her system because now, you know, when folks don't have anything to eat, what's in you is going to come out. The irritability, all of that is going to come out. It will come out. And I guess her husband had said something that she didn't like and she was trying to cut something and she took that knife and went after him. She said she cut up his gym suit or whatever he was in because she was trying to go after him. So if we've gone, <laughs> Darlene Thompson said, what? So we've gone on the fast and we come out like that. Then no, it's like the old saints said, we better go back and get some more Jesus because that's not um, that ain't the Holy Ghost. I just say it like that. That ain't the Holy Ghost. Here's a book that will help you. Celebration of Discipline. I've had the book for over 30 years. It's called The Path to Spiritual Growth by Richard J. Foster. Get that book. I'll keep it up there. Get that book and it will tell you what's supposed to happen during a fast and the changes that your body will experience. I'm going to say this. We won't die from going without food for a day, two days, even three days. Some of us could used to lose a few pounds but i will say this fasting does not make you lose weight if anything fasting may make you gain weight and the reason why is because um your system begins to look at it that all right you're getting ready to starve me and so when you do go back to eating all of a sudden it starts to grab everything uh, that you start to eat and it may end up causing a gain of weight don't do like some of us did after we went on a three-day fast. We went on that three-day fast. And in those days, you had Shoney's. And Shoney's had a breakfast bar. And after we got off the fast, Lord, we were in our mind tasting those eggs and sausage and hash browns and all of that, biscuits and gravy. Went to the Shoney's after a three-day fast. Mind you now, three-day fast. And um, after that, Lord, the saints um had all kind of problems you know bad dreams and everything like that nightmares and um how can i say this very diplomatically it will have an effect on your system i'll say it like that it will have an effect on your system there's a song that said running 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 i can't tarry so don't eat <laughs> don't eat all of um that heavy solid food after coming off of a consecration and um also, it's important when we go on fast that if there's things in our heart between us and someone else, we try to get those things right because fasting deals with humbling ourselves. Let me let me give you some things that um, James Wesson says your church would have barley soup and ginger ale. I can see the barley soup. Not certain about the ginger ale, but um, yeah, a absolutely. In in this book celebration of discipline it will tell you what's going to happen with you especially when you start to go on the longer fast because uh it will share about the irritability and why you're getting irritable and then how eventually that will pass and then basically you can go on as long as you need to go it actually shows you how to go on 40 days of fasting because we can survive for 40 days now i heard somebody saying something about and when i say i heard i'm talking about i'm seeing your comments I saw somebody say something about medication. Yes, you'll definitely want to consult with your doctor. Uh, you don't want to go into some type of um, uh, sickness or illness. There have been people that have passed away because of their constant fasting. They fasted so much, but did not take care of themselves. And so we do have to be wise in that regard. So consult with your physician in regard to that. Let me share with you some scriptures. And again, Bishop Mason is the one that set this as a discipline in the church. Unfortunately, um, we've gotten away from it and we just need to go back. Some things you don't need to give up. Some things you need to go back to. Biblical principles on fasting. This is what the Bible says. So when we fast, we're not going around bragging to people about what we're doing. Psalm 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. 
I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. Now that's a double edged sword because if you're calling your church to a fast, you want people to fast along with you. Yes, there are certain announcements that you may have to make, for example, on social media. Everybody that's a part of, you know, Main Street Church of God in Christ, we want you to fast with us. But really, it shouldn't extend beyond that. You don't want to get online and start talking. About, What's wrong with you? Oh, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. That's really something that's personal between you and God. And when we set ourselves up like we're some spiritual giant and look what we did, look what we're doing right now, we're getting glory from that. And that's totally uh, anti what fasting is all about. It says here in Psalm 35, 13, we humble our soul with fasting. Now, what is our soul? Our soul is our emotions, our will, our intellect, our reasoning. And that soul, a lot of time, that soulish part of us wants all of that honor and reverence from people. But when we humble our soul, we put it under subjection. We put the flesh, that sinful nature, up under subjection. And we're not trying to be seen. We're not trying to get people to give us accolades and glory. Isaiah 58, 3 through 10 reading it from the easy to read version, which makes it a little easier to digest uh, as far as the um, language is concerned, because sometimes it may be a little harder as far as the um, King James. It says, they say, we fast to honor you. Why don't you see us? They're talking to God now. Imagine talking to God like that. We starve our bodies to show honor to you. Why don't you notice us? But God said, you do things to please yourselves on those special days of fasting, and you punish your servants, not your own bodies. You're hungry, but not for food. You're hungry for arguing and fighting. And you see there, that's what the old saints taught us. You got to get that stuff out of you. Don't be doing all of that and you call yourself on a fast. You're hungry for arguing and fighting, not for bread. You're hungry to hit people with your evil hands. This is not the way to fast if you want your prayers to be heard in heaven. This is God talking now. Do you think I want to see people punish their bodies on those days of fasting? Do you think I want people to look sad and bow their heads like dead plants? Do you think I want people to wear mourning clothes and sit in ashes to show their sadness? This is what you do on your days of fasting. Do you think that this is what the Lord wants? I will tell you what kind of day I want, a day to set people free. I want a day that you take the burdens off others. I want a day when you set troubled people free and you take the burdens from their shoulders. I want you to share your food with the hungry. I want you to find the poor who don't have homes and bring them into your own homes. When you see people who have no clothes, give them your clothes. Don't hide from your relatives when they need help. <laughs> I see folk lock the door. That's so-and-so coming. They want some help. He says, don't hide from your relatives when they need help. If you, <laughs> if you do these things, your light will begin to shine like the light of dawn. Then your wounds will heal. Your goodness will walk in front of you and the glory of the Lord will come following behind you. Then you will call to the Lord and he will answer you. You will cry out to him and he will say, here I am. Stop causing trouble and putting burdens on people. See there? Putting, causing trouble and, and fasting at the same time. There's something wrong with that. Stop things, saying things to hurt people or accusing them of things they didn't do. Feel sorry for hungry people and give them food. Help those who are troubled and satisf satisfy their needs. Then your light will shine in the darkness. You will be the light. You will be like the bright sunshine at noon. So can you see? That that's why we have so much false accusation, gossip and trouble and people saying things to hurt people and trying to tear people down. Reason why is because we as the body of Christ, we're just not fasting like God wants. We may go on these different fasts and things like that. But he's saying here, if your actions are not going to change, your heart's not going to change, you're not going to treat people any different. He says, I'm not paying that any attention. You're just doing that just as a religious show. That's not anything to change you. Again, it goes back up to Psalm 35, 13. I humble my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. I put myself down. I put God up. I put others before me so God could do something in me. Realize this. We're not fasting in order to try to manipulate God and work witchcraft on people. Some of these people talking about, oh, I went on a. 30 day fast. I went on a 21 day fast and doing nothing but witchcraft, praying stuff on people, 
trying to put stuff on on people and when i say stuff yeah i'm talking about that stuff who do voodoo whatever you want to call it you know that's not what it's about when you read isaiah 58 it's about lord do something in me not what i'm trying to twist god's arm to do and not me trying to control somebody else but lord consecrate me mother byers at our church new jerusalem used to sing a song consecrate me lord consecrate me lord amen somebody else say that put that in the comment section consecrate me lord matthew chapter 6 16 through 18 jesus taught us how to do it he said when you fast don't make yourselves look sad like the hypocrites they put a look of suffering on their faces so people will see that they're fasting the truth is that's all the reward they'll get so when you fast wash your face make yourself look nice then no one will know that you are fasting did you hear what the book said saints no one will know that you're fasting i believe that if we really consecrate before god we don't have to tell people it's gonna hey, die. glory thank you jesus hallelujah glory to god it's gonna show hallelujah you don't even have to put it out there it's gonna show hey i was talking to somebody the other day and i said let me mess with him i said you i said you're a prayer warrior aren't you they almost went up in the tongues i said i can tell it hey I said, I can tell when somebody's been in the presence of God and been seeking after the face of God. I can tell when somebody's been laying on their face before God. You don't have to, you don't have to sit up there and try to convince people about glory. Thank you, Jesus, or who you are and what you are and what you have. You don't have to do it. It will show you won't be able to hide it. Glory to God. You walk in and folks will say, you know, there, you must be a preacher. There's something about you. I go into places all the time. I don't go broadcasting anything like that talking about who i am or what i am but folks that walk up you must be a preacher you must be a man of god i see something on you so that's what the that's that's what the master said in matthew 6 18 jesus said it help me say that open up your mouth and say jesus said it. he said then no one will know you are fasting except your father who is with you glory to god thank you jesus hallelujah hey thank you lord even in private, hallelujah. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, I thank you, you're with me, even in private. Glory to God. He can see what is done in private and he will reward you. So it's important that we go to that secret place with him. Matthew chapter six, verses 16 through 18. I don't know about you, but that's powerful. Meeting God in the secret place, meeting God in private. That's what it's about, having a private consecrated life before god that's what the man of god ch mason taught us he didn't teach us to worship him he didn't teach us to he bishop mason told the the saints he's a man just like everybody else but he taught us the way and there's so many others that came along my late pastor bishop westbrook bishop b e. harris moore bishop moore would get to praying you'd almost think it was ch mason you'd hear him yes lord yes lord yes lord won't you take that up right now? Everybody just start telling God, yes. Yes, Lord. Come on, that's it. Tell him, yes, Lord. How long do I say it? Say it till Shiloh comes. Who is Shiloh? Tell you what, you keep saying, yes, Lord. Shiloh will introduce himself to you and you won't have any doubts of who he is. And so this is what it is all about. This is what it is definitely all about as far as consecration. Let me give you some examples of individuals that consecrated and fasting and praying and followed this practice and um as a result god blessed their ministry now again let me say something i'm going to say something and some people may get offended at this and i'm not saying this to offend anyone but i'm saying what the facts were during those early days the church of god in christ specifically sanctified pentecostal churches in general were known for spirituality you had basically three different religious experiences in the black community in those early days even in my days coming up you had the baptist church you had the methodist church and you had the holiness church the baptist church of course tremendous preaching and singing ability but definitely known for social activism in the community. People like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 
Reverend Jesse Jackson, individuals like that emanate from the Baptist church. They were known for social activism. You had the Methodist church and the Methodist church was known in the community for tremendous education. The AME churches in AME Zion, CME uh, congregations that were part of that denomination had great schools and educational institutions. Many of your school teachers were from the Methodist church, very proud individuals because of um, their ability to thrive through tremendous suffering and racism. But then your holiness churches in general, your church of God in Christ specifically was known for spirituality. That's what the holiness church was known for. There might be some social activism, there might be some emphasis on education, but the main thing, if you go over there, you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you go over there, they believe in healing. If you go over there, they believe in giving God the praise exuberantly. I remember a time where there were people said it didn't take all of that. Now, it's, it's in vogue now for people to have praise breaks and things. But I remember a time when people would say that's an extreme. That's not any way to worship and reverence God. You should reverence God by having a reverential and quiet worship environment. But you go over there, they're falling out on the floor. They're all up under the benches. They're foaming at the mouth. It reminds me of a song that I heard years ago. And it said, the first time I heard about the Holy Ghost, I thought it was a shame that all that shouting and teaching was done in Jesus' name. They said it was in the Bible and I didn't want to doubt. So I went around to see them and to hear them sing and shout. They were shouting hallelujah. They were prostrate on the floor. They were dancing in the spirit from the pulpit to the door. They were quaking, they were shaking. As one by one they fell, I looked at some that shook so much, it looked like they had a spell. Stayed just a little bit longer, wondering what my folk would say. I knew they didn't like it in that Pentecostal way. When just a day or two ago, I heard my father say, son, when I got my religion, I didn't act that way. And then it says, and when you get the Holy Ghost, I know you'll speak in tongues. All the folks around you know that the Holy Ghost has come. Acts 2, 4, 10, 44, I heard the Bible say, and also the 19th chapter of Acts, they all came through that way. Man said, I started for the altar with a hunger in my soul. I forgot about the people. I let the Holy Ghost take control. And then he talks about how God filled him with the precious gift of the Holy. That's actually a song, it's somewhat of a poem as well. But again, there was so much extreme criticism against this way. I don't have the sermon, and forgive me for that, because normally when I come to these um, uh, teachings, I, I have my research done. But this is something that came to me right before we got started. Dr. Martin Luther King preached a sermon. If anybody knows that sermon, you can put it in the comment section where he mentioned the three kind of churches. He said one kind of church is focused on social activism. One kind of church is focused on education and the other kind of church is just focused on going to heaven. Now, really, he didn't come out and say what kind of churches he was talking about, but he was talking about the Baptist, the Methodist and the sanctified. Sanctified people were considered their mind is just on living right and going to heaven. They care less about what happens. But can I be can I be honest with you? You, you live in so much peace when you're not focused on everything going on around you. There's all kind of controversies now. People are having a controversy about some church. And I know the church where they are accused of having a stripper pole at a men's conference and a man and uh, took his shirt off and ate a sword and all that kind of thing. Uh, at the church, they're explaining now that it wasn't a stripper pole, it was acrobatics, whatever like that. And folks are arguing online about that. But you know, for holiness people, our mind is not on that. Because first of all, that's not how we act in our churches. And we're not focused on that. And the first thing we'll say is that's why you got to be holy and different. And then you won't deal with all of that foolishness. And so I love this way. Let me tell you some people that went on fast and God used them. Elder Larry Lee the second. Bishop G.E. Patterson, former presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ. You're familiar with his tremendous preaching ministry, but do you realize what catapulted his ministry was he went on a three-day and night 
consecration. No food, no water. The extreme fast I talked about in Acts 9 and 9, the kind of fast that Bishop Mason taught on. When he came off of that three day and three night fast, what ended up happening after that, all of a sudden his ministry catapulted and they said he became known as God's young apostle. And they said after he came off of that three day fast, it was almost like he could call crowds just at will. And then God would use him in a mirac miraculous manner. I remember um, the late Timothy Wright. He used to come to our church all the time here in St. Louis. He talked about, I believe it was his son or uh, it could be, could be his son that he said he went on a three day fast and anointed his son's hand so his son could play. And uh, after he came off that fast and that consecration, then the rest is history. These are the kind of things that the saints would do. They would go on a consecration and ask God to do it before he went off track. Carlton Pearson, before he went off track and teaching all of the different strange doctrines, he was in the church of God in Christ, sanctified church, sanctified man. He wanted to sing. And he went on a three day and three night fast and said, God, I want to sing. He came off that consecration and God anointed him. And so even before all of this strange teaching he went into, um, you could hear the anointing in his singing. And that came through fasting and through prayer. There's a few other individuals that God used in the great manner. Where can we get this literature you got, Hankerson? You can't get this, but this is the 1992 calendar for the Church of God in Christ. And this is a part, I think this was a part of the Saint Center fundraising. In the 1982 calendar, uh, bless you, Bishop Futrell, my bishop from St. Louis. Uh, there's a man listed here, Elder Jesse Smith. He was from Texas and he wrote a book on fasting and prayer. He got that prayer mantle from Bishop Mason and he went on a consecration. God anointed him and God gave him a tremendous healing ministry. Elder Jesse Smith from Texas. There he is right there. And so it says Elder Smith's legacy to our generation was a spirituality. He wrote a small book on prayer and fasting based on Mark 9, 29, entitled The Spiritual Hook. And in that book, it talked about fasting and praying. And it says here about Elder Jesse Smith, from the New Jerusalem Church of God in Christ on Don Drive in Dallas. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Mm -mm -mm. God performed many miraculous works through Elder Smith. While Elder Smith was gainfully employed at a huge aircraft plant in Dallas, a friend gave him a book on fasting by Franklin Hall. He was stirred in spirit to fast until God would destroy all the spirits of the flesh so God could fully use him. His first fast for six days was hindered by family interference. The next fast was for 10 days. And on the ninth day, God proved his power. A woman was brought in whose body was nearly decimated by cancer. Elder Smith was so weak physically, he could hardly stand. But the power of God permeated the atmosphere. Elder Smith pointed toward this woman and took authority over her body. And immediately the woman leaped from the cot, praising God for healing and later gained up to 200 pounds. Elder Smith once became sick unto death with cancer, diabetes, heart trouble, and an infection on his neck simultaneously. He was led to fast for 21 days because God was not through with him. He lost 30 pounds in a few days. And on the 13th day, Elder Smith's son took him home. But God said 21 days. He traveled to California with $40 in cash in order to obey God. He went down to 140 pounds in flesh, but emerged a giant in the power of the spirit. Upon returning to Dallas, Elder Smith resigned from his job and entered full-time ministry. His ministry was punctuated and characterized by many miracles, signs, and wonders. For he believed to the end of his days, after rearing four children to God's glory, that fasting and prayer was vitally necessary. In the tradition and spirit of our founder, Bishop C.H. Mason, fasting and prayer will loose the bounds of wickedness. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
bless your name, undo heavy burdens, break every yoke, and let the oppressed go free. Hallelujah. Somebody say, Lord, I thank you. Just give him praise right there. Glory to God. God bless you, Supervisor Gray. That's in the 1982 Saint Center calendar. And this is the 1981 calendar, the Living Heritage calendar, produced by the Church of God in Christ when we were uh, in the process of focus at that time, of course, on uh, Saint Center. In this calendar, one of the months, September, it talks about Mother Elizabeth Dabney. And of course, I've mentioned her before, and she has a book. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Hallelujah. It's, hey, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. She has a book on fasting and prayer. And uh, you can get that book. I have it over here, but I'm not going to dig for it. Lost the title, the, the, the title of it. Somebody put the title in. What it means to pray through. That's the book. But Mother Dabney, her husband was a pastor. They were both up under Bishop O.T. Jones there in Philadelphia. And to let her tell it in the book, her husband wasn't, <laughs> he couldn't preach. I'll just say it like that. I don't know how to, how to flower it up. Her husband couldn't preach. And she just said that she gave him books and everything and said, Lord, help him. He just can't preach. And so she went on a consecration asking God to bless the ministry. It says here, um, Mother Dabney's prayer ministry, for which she was best known, came about as a result of a covenant that she made with God. I want you all to hear this. Hear this, Bishop Dawes. Um, it says it came about Timothy Tyler saying what happened to St. Center. We never did build it. Uh, the finances from that were used to uh, refurbish Mason Temple. Uh, that's what ended up happening. I was in the General Assembly when Bishop Ford said that is abolished and we're not going to focus on that anymore. So he refurbished Mason Temple and then used uh, the rest of the funds to fix up Lexington, Mississippi, our school down there. Good question. So she went on this covenant. She made a covenant with God to pray at the church nine o'clock daily for three years. This is what she told God. She said, God, if you bless our ministry, if you break the bonds of wickedness in this wicked neighborhood, and if you anoint us, she said, for three years, I'm going to meet you every day at nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to fast. 72 hours, that's three days every week for two years. So not three days once a month, not three days every six months, three days and nights fasting every week for two years. And she spent that time in fasting and prayer. And it says, because of Mother Dabney's consecration, God greatly anointed her. At the end of three years, not aware that her time was up, she went to the church as usual and God locked the door. My God today, my God today, thank you, Lord, and would not allow her key to open the door. Mother Dabney's fame spread around the world because of the marvelous healings that God gave to multiplied thousands through her prayers. An eyewitness related that in one service, Nine blind persons received their sight. Mother Dabney received one million letters telling of, telling of healings and requesting prayer. One man, gun in his hand, on his way to, uh, let me see here. Thank you, Jesus. On his way to kill his wife and her suitor felt a hand take him into their church, the garden of prayer, where he ended up getting saved. And these are some of the things that God would do through the ministry of Mother Dabney. Of course, she was persecuted. They called her an old witch. One time somebody showed up at the church and they put people to go to the church and uh, they said she's an old witch and she's got a magic book. So folk would knock on the door and ask the witch, that's what they called her, can we see your magic book? One lady even tried to kill her. One lady was out to kill her, to murder her, and said, you're going to stop this. The, the, these demons get upset when you start 
consecrating like that for real, not just doing it to be seen in the show, your spirituality, but to do it for real. Somebody will lift their hands and say, Lord, take us back. So let's believe God, saints, that we will take on that mantle, not just of the prayer, but also the fasting that Bishop Mason instilled in this church of God in Christ. The reason why people like Mother Dabney and Elder Smith focused on that was because, again, Bishop Mason instilled that in the church. But after his death, there were so many people traumatized from those days of lack those days of suffering, those days of struggling, those days of not having anything to eat that many said we don't ever want to go back to that again. Because I remember when, <laughs> when Bishop J.O. Patterson Sr. was in the process of transitioning. This was about 1989. He first shared with us at the Women's Convention in Portland, Oregon in 1989. Uh, that he had been diagnosed terminally. And then, of course, he shared that with us in December, in November of 89 in the International Convocation. By December, he had passed away. But one of the things that Bishop Patterson was stating was he said he prayed that through his sickness, the one thing that would come out of it is that the church would go back to old time holiness. And what he meant was this. Bishop Patterson and the saints um, wanted to modernize the church. And you can understand that Bishop Patterson believed in, um, you know, a lot of times in the neighborhoods, the Holiness Church was the most raggediest church there was in the neighborhood. He didn't believe in that. He believed in beautifying God's house. He believed that God's house was God's house and should look better than your own house. And so that was one of the ways he wanted to modernize things. He wanted to modernize things where those that have their education would not have to leave the Church of God in Christ and go to other churches to serve, but they could use their PhD, their master's degree, their bachelor's degree, their associate degree, etc., for the work of the Lord in the life of the church, specifically the Church of God in Christ. Um, so there were those modernizations that took place. But as we stated through the infighting that took place after the death of Bishop Mason, you find the people veering away from that focus on spirituality. And so he was praying that his sickness would be used to take us back to old time holiness. It was during that convocation in 1989, a lot of interesting things were stated. I heard, I'll just say it because it was public, Bishop L.H. Ford state specifically, he said that they repented during that meeting. He said, we repent for pushing Bishop Mason aside. He said, because that's what we did. We told Bishop Mason, dad, you don't know what you're talking about. So in Bishop Mason's declining years, they pushed him aside. And so there was repentance for that. There was much talk on going back. Fast forward, Bishop J.O. Patterson passes away. Before he passes away, he states, I want this to go back to being a holy convocation. You're not having all these different meetings and things taking place. He said, everybody needs to be here in the service, not this one over here having a meeting, that one over there having a meeting. Let's all be in the service and truly have a holy convocation. And he said that what we're going to do is in January, we're going to Birmingham. And he said, there won't be any meetings. He said, the elders won't be meeting. The bishops won't be meeting. The mothers won't be meeting. He said, won't nothing be meeting but the prayer meeting. And the Holy Ghost Conference was to focus on the working in the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the life of the believer. And so there was great talk around the country about going back. I heard many of the older saints saying, oh, no, we don't want to go back to that because they talked about so many of the prohibitions, so much of the suffering, so many of the things that they had to go through. They said, oh, God, we can't believe it. We're going back to that. And so. Um, a lot of the reason why, again, you see all of this talk about fasting thrown out is because you had people that were traumatized during those particular days. But saints, we might as admit it, might as well admit it that this new fabricated uh, gospel, if you want to call it a gospel and way of doing things, is not bringing deliverance. It's going to take the foundation that was laid by those early saints. So come on, saints, let's go back 
to the old time way. Jeremiah 6 and 16, stand in the way and ask for the path, which is the good way. Ask for that old path. But they said, we will not walk therein. And I trust that all of us have a mindset to walk therein. That's right. Jan Mason McLean says it's a lot of false teaching. There's a new false teaching. I, I'm, I'm finished. I won't have time to go into everything that I wanted to as far as responding to everyone. But I do see the wonderful comments that you uh, that you uh, have here in the comment section. Um, I, I will say this, this new teaching about grace. See, a lot of people are taking all these false doctrines and covering up in something nice. That false teaching that they have now about grace, that's nothing but eternal security. That's all that it is. It's nothing but eternal security. Once saved, always saved. And you have people that um, are supposed to be holy grabbing a hold of these things. The Bible says in the last days there'll be doctrines of devils. A devil is a demon. A doctrine is a teaching. In the last days, demons are going to be teaching through individuals. False teaching to lead the people astray. But I'm determined if I'm the last person standing, no compromise. I got to make it in. I got to see Jesus face in peace. I've gone through too much to get up to that gate. And the Lord said, depart from me, you that work iniquity, because I never did know you. So let's pray that we'll be the one that God is calling for in these last and evil days. Father, I've given the people what you've laid upon my heart to share. And that was to share about fasting and consecration, consecrating ourselves before you and being real, being sincere, being genuine about this walk with God. This is a serious walk and it's nothing to play with. And I pray that you would help us to be the ones that you're calling for in these last and evil days. Put love in our heart towards other people. Help us to be merciful. Help us to be kind. Help us to be teachable. Help us to be obedient. Help us to have humility. Help us to have sincerity. Help us to have long suffering, patience, patience with individuals, forgiveness. Put it all down in us, God. Take out the stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. Help us to be loyal to you and not to be distracted by the things that we experience in life. Now, Father, bless every viewer. And we pray that this message would be disseminated to others across the country and around the world and that you raise up an army that's consecrated unto you. Now, we're going to be careful to thank you and give you praise. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and all people. God said, thank God. Let everybody say amen. God bless your hearts. I'm going to get ready to go down from here. Bless you, Supervisor Gray. I see you. All of the wonderful saints of God, we appreciate you. God bless you, Bishop Doss. Awesome man of God, committed to holiness and righteousness, living right before God. Aaron Baker says part two. Yes, we'll be glad to do uh, something like that. God bless all of you. Listen, continue to pray for us. As you know, we are in the midst of uh, seeking to remain on the general board of the Church of God in Christ. And we ask for your support to find out more information. You can go to uh, bishopelijahankerson.com and ask that you spread the word far and near as we seek to do what God has placed upon our heart to do. Um, another announcement, our presiding bishop will be with us Friday in Missouri Midwest at the Main Street Church, 2000 Main Street in Decatur, Illinois. Be sure to join us there. Looking forward to a high time in the Lord. May God continue to bless. You can go to our website and give a donation to allow us to continue to move forward in the things of God. And we sure would appreciate that. May the Lord bless you real good. Don't forget, you got work to do. I got work to do. While we're doing the work, let's turn around. Why are we going to turn around? Because every time we turn around, God is blessing us. Have a wonderful evening is my prayer. As in the next 10 minutes, I go into teaching right here at the Life Center International Church of God in Christ, 8500 Halls Ferry. God bless your hearts.